embarrassing to talk about him and how he runs his life than to talk about my life that's so comical and, and like a cartoon. Well, Robert Fulgram in his book closed the scenario with this verse from Matthew chapter 16 verse 26. He said this question. Remember these questions? It said, uh, what good will be for a man if he gains the whole world but forfeits his own soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, it's been said that this uptight, this successful businessman in Robert Fulgram's book, he seems a world away. That man seems like he's a world away from the two men that Gunnar helped us read through in John chapter 1, verses 35 to 42. Those two men, if you remember in the scripture, about John the Baptist and Andrew. Now you have an outline in your bulletin, and if you want to fill it in as we go along, feel free to do that. And um, the two men, they're pointing people to Jesus Christ. They're pointing him, the, people to the man, capital M, the man among all men, Jesus. Wow, I mean, sometimes we look back and we think about our lives and we think, hey, I'm a success. Everything's going my way. Then we see Jesus. And we know immediately that things are incomplete. Life is incomplete. And he's the only one who offers life abundant and eternal. And oh, how we need to put ourselves under Jesus' guidance. Moment by moment, day by day, to be guided by Jesus Christ. Here I am. Um, you know, uh, just say to him, Lord, here I am. I was telling, I think, Pastor Park and others, uh, in our sibling reunion, we got to go to Branson, Missouri, and um, one of the um, productions we took in was called Noah. It was about Noah, Mrs. Noah, their three sons, their three daughter-in-law. It was like an auditorium that was just expanded of this sanctuary. I mean, here's we sat out where you are. They did most of the work up here in the ark. And then in the final, toward the final of it, if you can imagine three sides here, four stories high, real and artificial animals. The animals came in, they direct them into the ark, and you could see them around. It was something else. Now, here am I, here's Noah, and what really impressed me was, here's Noah speaking to God, and then we heard God's voice portrayed. And it was really something that he would speak with God so intimately, and God would speak with him and Mrs. Noah, and they were so joyful as they served the Lord. You see, we're focusing on Andrew. You know, I believe he would say, as we need to, like in Andrew in this lesson today, I want to get to be more and more like Jesus Christ. I think that's what Andrew would say. I want to be more and more like Jesus to whoever I meet, whatever I do. And I want to help others to get to be more and more like Jesus. Now, it was a Dr. James Moore who spoke about um, one of the great celebrative hymns or songs of the Christian faith that comes out of Afro-American culture. And it's so powerful. It's just called, a, what are they called? Spirituals? That's what I believe they're called, spirituals. And the name of this one is Ain't Got Time to Die. Now, whenever I use the word ain't at home, my grandmother would say, and my teachers would say early on, that is not in the dictionary. Ain't is not a word. Ain't fell in the paint. It ain't. No, no, she didn't say that. It isn't anymore. Well, she almost threatened to wash my mouth out if I used ain't. You know, soap and rag, and she did that one time when I used my tongue a different way than I should have. And I deserved every bit of it. I didn't like it one moment. I didn't like it at all. But ain't. But now, if you look in Webster's Dictionary now, it's in there. <laughs> my grandmother's already gone to heaven, and I can't show it to her now. <laughs> Well, anyway, it was written by Hal Johnson, Hall Johnson, and uh, these dramatic words have been like this. Listen carefully. 
Been so busy praising my Jesus. Been so busy working in the kingdom. Been so busy serving my master. Ain't got time to die. <laughs> if I don't praise him, if I don't serve him, if the rock's going to cry out, glory and honor, glory and honor, ain't got time to die. That's how that spiritual goes. I ain't got time to die. Well, I believe the uh, author is underscoring and celebrating the joy and excitement of being a Christian. When we really become a Christian, when we really sell out to Jesus completely and we commit our lives to him, we can't sit still. We're so excited. We're so thrilled. So grateful for our new life that we love him and we praise him and we serve him and we exalt him and we worship him and we thank him. Well, I think about Andrew. Now notice in verse 41. You notice that in John chapter 1 verse 41. It said the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him we have found the Messiah, the Christ. He was so excited, Andrew was. He couldn't sit still. Well, think about it. There are four main points, and we want to cover two of them today briefly, and then two next week. It just comes with being a Christian. In the outline, the number one is this. The greatness of Andrew came because he was consistently introducing others to Jesus. Introducing others to Jesus. Somebody comes around, and... Uh, uh, you're talking to a friend and somebody's coming that's your friend and they don't know that person it's a kindness to introduce them we should introduce them well what about introducing them to our best friend of all Jesus Christ so the greatness of Andrew came about because he was consistently consistently introducing others to Jesus that's point number one now talk about excited. I mean he discovered. He received the very best. And pronto. He doesn't he hasn't just heard about him. He tells others about him. He goes all out for Jesus. Look in verses 41 and 42. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You're Simon the son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Here is what you're going to be called. And so he found him. Well, he brought his brother Peter to Jesus. This is uh, the greatness of Andrew. Wouldn't it be something... I pray, I pray from this day on, you'll pray this prayer if you haven't already. That every one of us in this sanctuary today, we may know each other, we may not know each other. But after we get introduced to Jesus, we've received him as Savior and Lord by faith. Between now and December 31st, that's about 150 some days I think, to introduce somebody to Jesus. Wouldn't that be something? Our congregation would be transformed. It would be revolutionized. Say, but I don't know how to do that. But we can learn how to do that. And that's a word of encouragement. That's not putting a hammer down on you. That's just saying, here's the opportunity. And we have a number of contacts to do that with. Consistently introduce. How, how do we get to Jesus? You know, three different times, somebody pointed this out to me and I want to share it with you today. Here in John 1 is the first time. I believe it's in John 6, it's the second time. And in John 12, it's the third time. Now listen to this about Andrew. Listen to this. He comes center stage. He's bringing someone to Jesus in each of these chapters. Chapter 1. He brings his brother Simon Peter. You know what he could have... Well, did oh my, wasn't it Andrew and Simon Peter? Whenever you think of the disciples, who do you usually think of first? Peter. See, in a sense, Andrew played second fiddle to him the rest of his life. He didn't get hung up on that. He didn't say, well, he's a braggadocio, he's a braggart, he's, he's a head, uh, you know, I'm not going to help him. He's my brother, I'm not going to help him. 
No, he didn't worry about being second fiddle or ninth fiddle or sixteenth bass. He introduced him to Jesus. That's what we ought to do. In chapter 6 of John, um, I believe that Andrew brings to Jesus, I read in John 6 that Andrew brought to Jesus the boy who had five loaves of bread and two fish. How are they going to feed five, four or five thousand men and the women and the children? How are they going to do that? Andrew said, Jesus, here's a boy, he has lunch here. And they had basketfuls left over after they fed all, after Jesus blessed the fish and the bread, and basketfuls. There's a second time. First time in John 1, he introduces, he, he tells Simon Peter where the, where the real bread is, the eternal bread. And then he tells Jesus about this boy. And now in John 12, he brought to Jesus the inquiring Greeks who wanted to meet Jesus and visit with him. Do you know that there are people in our communities where we live and around our church building here? They're waiting to find out who Jesus really is. They're searching to find out. Some of them have said, I've already made up my mind. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Jesus. Don't give me this stuff. Oh, there's some like that. You don't quit because you don't stop sharing because somebody may not agree. You just keep going. Keep going. And God will reward your faithfulness and our faithfulness. It's been said and so true. I believe that Andrew's greatest joy was not only getting to Jesus, but introducing other people to Jesus. I heard my Sunday school teacher used to tell me, once you get to Jesus, the greatest joy after that is introducing somebody to Jesus. And he was right. Walter Miller was right. He was right on. Now consider one woman. She was excited to be a Christian. She had a bad past. She pretty much hit rock bottom. But a friend reached out to her. That's what we need to be doing. Reaching out to people. We may not reach out physically like this. But we reach out in our minds, in our words, in our actions. And uh, they welcomed her warmly. That person brought her to church. And they were very kind to her at the local church. And she, she learned about God's love. And so she started going regularly. And she had a wonderful Sunday school class. She began to study the Bible herself. She hadn't done that. And she began to study the Bible. And in the process, she was converted. We would say converted, saved, born again, personal relationship with Jesus, any, whatever, however you describe it. By faith, she asked God to forgive her sins. She admitted them. She asked Jesus to come into her heart and life as her Savior and Lord, and she went on to live for Him. She was converted. Now, she realized for the first time in her life, the first time, that God loved her. He loved her. She'd had a very bad past. She came to understand that even though earlier she had done these awful things, terrible things, God loved her. He'd forgive her. And she committed herself to Christ. And she said to a Christian, to another Christian, I'm so excited to be a Christian. I've got a strong case of the can't help it. <laughs> Do you have a strong case of the can't help it today? You just can't help it, but being that's part of being a Christian. You want to introduce others to you. You just can't help it. That's what she said. I've got a strong case of the can't help it. Well, Andrew had a strong case of the can't help it. He was super thankful. He was thrilled. He was excited. He couldn't sit still. Now, number two on your outline. We want to finish with this part of it. Number two. Because we are Christians, we can't help but be grateful. G-R-A-T-E-F-U-L. If you know that word backwards and forwards, forgive me. Don't. I'm not putting you down. 